It is now dawn of June 6, 1964, over the English Channel and all of Europe, where the 20th anniversary of the Normandy invasion is being observed. This special 90-minute CBS report by General of the Army Dwight D. Eisenhower with Walter Cronkite is being shown today on 22 networks in 19 countries throughout the world. Is the coast of Normandy, whose beaches, Gold, Juneau, Sword, Utah, and Omaha now live in history. Along this narrow stretch of sand and sea, a battle was joined between the world of freedom and the world of tyranny. For nearly five terror-filled years, hundreds of millions of people lived under the Nazi jackboot that had enslaved Europe. The Allied troops were fighting to win a foothold at first and total victory. And if possible, to carve out a dream of a world without war. 20 years ago, in this our own time, the largest invasion in history assaulted Hitler's European fortress. Beaches were beachheads then, and the world was at war. This is the last alerting announcement from Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle we will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Well, you can see from back here, Walter, this was where the battle took place, and it was a natural uh, thing to do because you knew you could blow out roads if necessary. But there were these four avenues, and that's what we were trying to, uh, to get through. And, uh, of course, as the battle finally developed, why well, everything went fine. But that first day was really the, was a tough one. Look, here well, comes a little yeah. nun well, with a whole little. Pause little... for another parade. <laughs> I hear that's something, isn't it? How's your sister? How do you do? How's your sister? Aren't they pretty children? If the GIs of 20 years ago could have seen that, that would have been something, wouldn't it? Here now is CBS Reports, D-Day plus 20 years. This is Southwick House near Portsmouth on the south coast of England. Today it serves as a Royal Naval School, but 20 years ago it was the forward tactical base of Chafe, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. From here the D-Day spark was ignited that led to the liberation of the continent. To recapture the tempo of that time, General Eisenhower returned to the war room with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite, where the original invasion map has been preserved just as it appeared that morning of 6 June 1944, with the units frozen at D-Day, H-Hour. This room was then the most secret in the Allied world. General, when in the planning did Normandy first come into the picture as the site? Well, the detailed planning started long about um, the fall of 1943 and was under charge of a man named um, 
uh, Morgan, General Fred Morgan of the uh, British Army, and it took months of planning, and he uh, really, he was in many ways the father of the plan that was executed here, uh, the start being on D-Day. And what about the date? When was that first chosen? Well, we, um, there's a, first of all, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the two governments, the Western governments, had told um, Generalissimo Stalin that we would attack in May. So we began to examine the weather, and um, we had to have a particular combination of tides, light, and moon. And this was, uh, uh, showed that you had about uh, a few days in, um, in June where you could have the perfect conditions, or nearly perfect conditions, and a few uh, days in May. We'd like to have gone on the 5th of May. But we, to get the breadth of attack we thought necessary, we had to wait until June. Now, the uh, ideal days were from June, of, well, June 4th. 5th was the ideal day, but 4th was satisfactory, 5th, 6th, and uh, 7th, and even possibly 8th. But that would have been stretching a little bit. Now, I picked July 5th. I mean, uh, June 5th is the best. And we came uh, down here hoping and praying that the weather would be sufficiently good we could go on the June 5th. Well, General Eisenhower, June 4th was the day when you had to make the decision to go on June the 5th. That is correct. What happened on that day, June 4th? Early on the morning of June 4th, I came from my camp about a mile from here, came into this room. And uh, Captain Stagg, who was the chief meteorologist for the Allied forces, with he, he was supported by two or three Americans and a couple other Britishers. But he made the presentations. That morning, the stars were out. It looked beautiful. And he gave us the worst report you ever saw. It, and he talked about gales uh, hitting the uh, Normandy beaches and uh, uh, winds up to, the, you know, the rate of 45 miles an hour, that kind of thing, landing would be impossible. So I just said, all right, we have to postpone. So we postponed for 24 hours. There wasn't any question of going the 5th. I mean, none of your commanders said, uh, oh, no. advise well, going. I believe, I believe Montgomery said uh, he was ready to go. But uh, it didn't, the, the, the conditions were such that I knew. We'd had our troubles down in, um, in uh, the Casablanca Beach, when, we, when you got uh, surf pretty high. We also had had some in uh, Sicily. So it was no, no uh, it, it was done in the card. You couldn't go. Uh, so, though, uh, so you stood down on the That's fourth. That's right, so and, that was the, and the weather when we did that looked so lovely. But in the morning of the fifth, Walter, here's the big thing. Morning of the fifth, I came over here. The weather was terrible. This house was shaking. Now. You know, this, uh, you said, well, there's no use almost of uh, looking at this thing again, but there's this one thing about it. It certainly increased my confidence in Captain Stagg and his crowd because the 24, hour, 24 hours earlier, when it looked so bad, uh, so nice, they said, this is what you're going to have, and we had it. Oh, it was really storming. General Eisenhower, who was here with you? Well, first of all, was my chief of staff, General Smith, an American. And then we had General Montgomery from the British forces and General Bradley from ours. Then there was uh, Ramsey, who was the naval commander, uh, Lee Mallory, who was the uh, British commander of the uh, air forces. Uh, my deputy was Tedder, and all those people were here. And there wasn't too much talk. We listened, and ever all of us had heard this, you know, time and again, because you remember, we had made practice runs. We'd had uh, Captain Stagg and his group before us, certainly before me, for twice a day for some days to just uh, see how this thing worked out. After, because we'd always have the proof two days later, you see. And um, he had told us the evening before, we might have a little bit of improvement in this weather next day. And um, we talked that over. That was about 10 o'clock on the night of June the 4th. We talked it over and we chatted around here maybe for a half hour. But the next morning, when he came in, sort of a little grin on his face, he, he didn't laugh too much, but he was a fine man. And uh, he said, well, now I'll give, some, give you some good news. And then he told us about this high that got in here and gave us some uh, hope. And he, as I remember, he predicted this good weather would last between 24 and 36 hours. 
Now, that wasn't too good because you could get so many troops uh, ashore and then have to stop landing, and it would be pretty bad. But we were trying uh, for these, um, you know, these artificial ports, and we hoped that uh, with this break, we could do it. It was still a chancy thing. But when he gave it and said that there are the waves now on the beaches were not going to be more than three feet or something of that kind, and the wind was going down, there'd be some opportunity for bombing, and the gunfire from the naval ships could be spotted pretty well. I thought it was just the best of the a bad bargain, so I possibly sat silently just reviewing these things, maybe, oh, I'd say, 35 or 45 seconds. Now it's been reported by some of the people present. For example, my own chief staff says that's five minutes. Well, I know that one, but five minutes under such conditions sounds like a year. Actually, I'd think after 30, 45 seconds, something like that, I just got up and said, OK, we'll go. And uh, ever, <laughs> this room was emptied in two seconds. Well, after you made your decision, what, what were you thinking of during those 45 seconds? Well, I think just reviewing briefly all of the uh, possibilities you had for a, a success and what would be the penalties, uh, not only of failure, of making a bad decision if you were too uh, rash, on the other hand, the penalties of not making a decision and saying, we'll wait some more. And I think that uh, I just reviewed them in my mind and said uh, I thought the best uh, opportunity now we were given sort of a God-given opportunity in this little space of good weather, of which the Germans knew nothing, it turned out later. And I said yes. Now, this was at uh, approximately 0415, 415, yeah. June the 5th. You had a, about 20 hours to wait before the first airborne troops went in, and 24 hours before, 26 hours before the ground forces hit the beach. What did you do during all those hours of waiting? Well, of course, that's the most terrible time for the senior commander. He's done all that he can do, all the planning. And matter of fact, there's very little more that any commander below, uh, I mean above, division command can do anything after once you get started. So the uh, first thing I did, I went over and uh, fortified myself with a lot of coffee and uh, breakfast. Then I began to go up and down the wharves, some of the... Uh, Ships were still starting out, and um, I saw people that had sent them off and so on. And I uh, came up here during the middle of the day to see if any news coming out, and I kept pretty close to my uh, communication center. And then finally, along about uh, 6 in the evening, I went over to a field from which the uh, Airborne, the American Airborne, started out. Now, I couldn't go to all these fields because there were many of them. But I did go into the 101st Division, and um, it was a very fine experience. They were getting ready, and all camouflaged, and their faces blackened and all this. And there they saw me, and of course they'd recognize me. They said, now quit worrying, General. We'll take care of this thing for you. And that kind of, of uh, thing was a good feeling. As they started off, I watched them out of sight. Then it took me a couple hours to get back to my headquarters. One of the most famous pictures of D-Day was of you talking to the paratroopers oh, yeah. in their camouflage. Oh, yeah. And one of the versions of that visit, uh, I think, said that as you turned away, this reporter saw a tear in your eye. Well, I don't know about that. It, it could have been possible. Because, look, here's the kind of uh, an operation you start. You know there are going to be losses along the line. They're going to be bad because we knew this. They were mobile troops, uh, uh, German troops in that area. There was all sorts of uh, flak, they call, you know, anti-aircraft stuff. And there could easily have been uh, fighters coming into these helpless uh, troop carriers. It's a, um, I would think, if a man didn't show a bit of emotion, it would uh, show that he uh, probably was a little bit inhuman. And uh, goodness knows, those fellows meant a lot to me. And uh, you just had to make these decisions on the bay when you're in war. I'm going to do something that my, will be to my country's advantage for the least cost. You can't say without cost. You know they're going to lose them. 
Well, now, in the selection of Normandy, as opposed to the Pas de Calais area, where the crossing was much shorter and so forth, uh, was the surprise element of Normandy the principal factor in making that decision, or were there other well, factors? Well, yes, it? that was one. Now, although, strangely enough, uh, Hitler, with all his intuition, did have one good guess, but he never uh, uh, thought it was good enough that he would order the main uh, defense to be made in Normandy. We knew, of course, you could not keep the Germans from knowing that the great things were afoot. We had to, de to try to, uh, to surprise him on location and timing. And then timing, not only in the general timing, but if possible, in the, uh, the time of day. In any way that you could uh, would surprise him, that was all to our benefit. How do you think we succeeded so well in keeping the secret of the location and the day? Well, of course, extreme, uh, extreme measures were taken. When we started to move the uh, troops south to get for their embarkation places, we just pinned them up, and we wouldn't let them out. There was no running around with the, in, in the villages around here. The people down in these um, cages, you might say, you couldn't call them anything else because they were fenced in, they were crowded up, and everybody was unhappy, and worse than this. We went so far that we stopped all diplomatic exchanges from uh, the uh, embassies of the world with London, and this was embarrassing to their government, but they were sturdy. They stuck right by it. We did everything to keep any information going out, and on top of that, we did a lot to confuse the enemy. We put phantom armies, and we put uh, radios and things with phantom messages going back and forth all the time between a army group commander and his new outfits. Well, to show you how we succeeded, Mr. Spidell, or General Spidell of the German army, who was the chief of staff to Rommel, in his writing his book five years later, he said, we wondered why the Allies didn't use very quickly their 75 divisions. We didn't have 75 divisions. We had about, I think it was 35 in all England, in, or all Britain, including the Canadian, the British, and one Polish, and I think a French, and, and uh, all of our own. And in more than that, the Germans kept those own horses back in, uh, in uh, the Pas de Calais. They kept those, all those divisions uh, when we were fighting in Normandy because they still believed the main attack was coming over Pas de Calais. So our, our deception measures worked well. General Eisenhower, what was your greatest concern on D-Day? What worried you most? Well, more than anything else, the uh, airdrop, particularly the airdrop in the Cotentin Peninsula. We thought that it was necessary because here is the Utah Beach down here, right, right here, really is where the landing spot. Behind that was a big lagoon that had been constructed by the Germans. Over that lagoon, which was a deep one, were just uh, several um, exits, and only three of them were usable. Now, we felt, unless we had some of the paratroopers to come and get the exits of that um, lagoon, these people here might be pinned down and then uh, Bosch uh, artillery and uh, mortars and so on, just uh, pound them to pieces and the thing would be done, uh, just no good. This attack, uh, first of all, was just gonna be this. Now we wanted to widen it to get this in here and to get Sherberg more quickly and to uh, uh, spread the defenses. Well, Air Chief Marshal Lee Mallory, very courageous man, had uh, made up his mind that this area in here, which had been uh, reinforced with mobile troops and uh, which had a lot of flak, and particularly along the coastlines, would uh, just be uh, uh, probably uh, too tough for the air uh, uh, the paratroopers to get in there. But we had done uh, the best we could, and with uh, General Bradley and General Ridgway, Ridgway being the, the uh, senior uh, paratrooper you know, of the Americans, we decided that uh, it ought to go on anyway, and we needed to go on if we were gonna have this attack go in. Well, uh, Lee Mallory accepted it for the moment, but he came back, and uh, he was so sure we were making a bad error that about a day or two before the attack, he came to see me down in my camp down here. And he just, uh, he was really earnest in his uh, recommendations, we must not do it. Well, I went, again, I went back to my 
my trailer by myself and refused. There was no use for any more experts on this thing. And I went on this theory, that this attack without this was not a good gamble. From the beginning, we'd all agreed on that. Now, we had to make some adjustments of where they were going in because the Germans had been reinforcing in here. But there was a little town in here, in uh, uh, San Mary Glees, and that was to be captured, these exits, and then to protect our left flank as we came in here, why that was the, the mission of the, of the paratroopers. Now, although they had some high losses, they were nothing like uh, uh, Lee Mallory had uh, feared they'd be. And by the way, I had a message, I think something about 2.30 or 3 in the morning, that they landed, and uh, when he found out things were going pretty well very early in the morning, he called me up, and you never heard a man so enthusiastic. Oh, he, he said, I'm sorry I made your burden stronger. He really was a top-flight fellow. Unfortunately, he was killed before the war was over. General Eisenhower, uh, I gather that at one point you wrote a, a message that you prepared to send if there was disaster on the beaches. Well, uh, Walter, I must tell you something. I did. And I don't know exactly who found out about it, but it was published. What I did was this. From the beginning, I had been partly responsible for this. I had been the staff, the head of the staff, that uh, originally outlined this operation way back two years ago. From all those two years, I'd believed on this thing. I believed it would defeat uh, Germany. And um, consequently, I felt a, not only as a commander, but as sort of a fellow who'd been uh, trying to convert everybody to the need of this thing, I felt a particular responsibility. So I wrote a little thing that said, the sound we assumed that we were going to be defeated, but I told no one else about it. And it must have been an aide that got this thing out and uh, told people about it. I just said, the landing has been a failure and it's no one's fault but mine. I uh, was the one that picked out the, I knew it couldn't fail except on weather. I was the one responsible for the decision to go, and uh, all the fault belongs to me, and that's that. Because if it did play, uh, uh, fail, you know this, I was going into oblivion anyway, so I <laughs> might as well take full responsibility. After his reunion with the past at Southwick House, General Eisenhower drove to the Royal Naval Yard at Portsmouth, where he was greeted as an old friend and comrade in arms. With a twittering of massed bosun's pipes, he sailed aboard a modern British frigate, HMS Gurkha, repeating the journey he made to the Normandy beaches in a British mine layer shortly after the landings. General, this harbor of Portsmouth must have been absolutely crammed with ships on that morning. Oh, it was. I uh, came on down here both on June the 5th and then uh, June the 6th. Some of the follow-up uh, people were still here, but on June 5th, it was jammed, you know. And uh, you see, the, the ship was delayed, and so on. These ships were all crowded. I uh, came in here and talked to the men, and we had, uh, I told them it would be all right, that's all you could say. But it was uh, an awful letdown. They, they'd been crowded on the ship already for some hours. General, there must have been a lot of men, I suppose, uh, who wished they weren't here that morning, but no. backed up there, too, there must have been an awful lot of men who wished they were aboard, who wanted well, to be aboard. that's right, first that's day. right. Well, <clears throat> of course, you know, all the people had been trained. They uh, thought it was their duty, that was their job. But, of course, no one likes to be uh, shot at too much. But uh, I must say, there was more people that wanted in than those that said, well, now we want to get off. One of those who wanted to go but was left behind was the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill himself, wasn't he? Yes. <laughs> he wanted to come, and he told me of his intention to uh, come. And I told him he couldn't do it. I was commander-in-chief of this operation, and I wasn't going to risk him because he was worth too much to the Allied cause. Well, he thought a moment, and he said, um, General, he said, do you have the operational command of uh, all of these forces? I said, yes, that's right. But he said, but you are not responsible for, administratively, for the makeup of uh, the crews. And I said, no, that's right. He said, well, then, 
He said, I can sign on as a member of the crew of one of His Majesty's ships, and uh, there's nothing that you can do. And, uh, and I said, uh, that's correct. But Winston, you will make my burden a lot heavier by doing it. So we left it at there. Well, luckily, the king uh, learned of his, um, of his side, intention. Side. <laughs> so the king just sent word and said, well, as long as the prime minister feels it uh, desirable to go along on this operation, he said, I think that uh, I uh, should. It'd be my duty now to go along with you. So uh, he sent word to the prime minister. He alone also would be. Well, of course, the prime minister didn't want to take chances with the king, so he didn't go. That was the way it, that's the way it stopped. He was a staunch old fighter, that fellow. He was opposed to this operation, though, for a while, wasn't he? Well, for a long time. You know, in the, in the, late, in the last uh, briefing we had, I think it was about May 15th, we'll say, he used an expression that the Americans thought rather odd. He said, um, I'm hardening toward this enterprise. Well, this meant uh, to us that he was beginning to become more confident of his success. But of course, uh, you must remember this. The British had visions of their experience in World War I, of getting on the ground fighting in France, and you had Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele and, and all of those other terrible battles where you would lose a couple of hundred thousand men and not gain a foot, or at least not gain any mileage. So uh, I think he was, it was only natural that he should be cautious about um, authorizing or giving his blessing to an operation where that might happen. And I told him that we were coming ashore equipped to make this a war one of uh, a movement. That need for a war of movement had launched the greatest armada of all time. Prime Minister Winston Churchill had warned the Allied nations of the cost. 1944 will see the greatest sacrifice of life by the British and American armies. Battles far larger and more costly than Waterloo or Gettysburg will be fought. Sorrow will come to many homes in the United Kingdom and throughout the Great Republic. British and American manhood striving in generous emulation, true brothers in arms will attack and grapple with the deadly foe. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt led the American people in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor. We will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogances. Lead us to the saving of our country. And with our sister nations, unity that will spell a sure peace. Thy will be done, almighty God. With the prayers of all the Allied world, the invasion forces surged through the choppy waters of the English Channel, led by a succession of minesweepers flying barrage balloons, flanked by PT boats. They carved a path through the German minefields to their appointed stations on the coast of France. Now, 20 years later, as General Eisenhower scanned the Norman coast, he explained the difficulties of guiding the right units to the right places in the pre-dawn darkness. You see, we'd um, put our uh, minesweepers in here to make sure that when we came in, that we weren't going to be uh, uh, hurt and damaged by the uh, mines. So we had all these minesweepers out ahead of us, that part of it. And uh, here, on the, uh, this flat bank, where the British were coming in, they did a very fine thing. They had a, um, uh, to guide these uh, small boats in. When you come out two or three, four miles, of course, you can easily get lost in the dark and uh, with, uh, with very few landmarks. 
They put in these little bits of tiny submarines, which had to lay on the bottom during the day that the, uh, that the postponement had taken place. But they came up when they knew the invasion was coming in. And they used uh, lights to the stern, you know, or shielded lights, radio, and even visual flags to help these people get right into the right place. And over here, where the currents were so bad, this was um, uh, very difficult over on the American beaches, and we had a great deal of uh, trouble getting into the right places. So, as a matter of fact, we didn't get into the right places often. But the men themselves took, took uh, charge a great deal. But the, the, uh, there's no question, over in this uh, one beach where all the fight took place, the naval gun support was really became finally the decisive factor. It was just absolutely superb. Were the naval losses uh, about what were expected, or higher were, or less? They were very, uh, very few, very few. And they, uh, and I think here and there we one that had a mine, here mine. Actually, uh, the fourth division, which hit Utah over here, was uh, they had only 200 men. Yet in a practice cruise. A practice landing on the south of England, we lost 700 men out of that same division about uh, just about a, two, a couple weeks earlier. Uh, they, two uh, uh, the German PT boats sneaked in and without anyone knowing it, hit uh, two LSTs. We lost 700 men and we didn't even know it until uh, the next day. I didn't have a report on it for 24 hours because it was just done so secretly. But, uh, and if it, anyone had known it, there'd have been a lot of a ref a rescue. But these poor fellows just uh, went down, that's all. What about the German Navy? It, it never appeared on D-Day. Well, they was over here in, uh, I think it was in Dover, no, up in La Havre. They had a little bit of mosquito uh, uh, fleet, and they tried to come out and uh, damage us a little on the left flank, but nothing happened of it to much. Thanks to the U.S. then Army Air Force uh, having depleted the resources of the Luftwaffe over the years of heavy bombardment and so forth. Uh, you didn't have any trouble with the Luftwaffe, but do you think you could have made this landing without the air superiority that we'd achieved? Oh, no, no. But you see, uh, over these years, we uh, not only knocked off the Luftwaffe, but we'd done this. Uh, way back to as far as two or 300 miles, we'd taken every field that we could find and just uh, pockmarked it. So it was uh, unusable at the time. And then, of course, uh, it was very bad weather. The German didn't believe that we could possibly land here. And so all in all, we, uh, we had a day that was free of enemy interference, except that we met on the, on the, on the beach. Well, General, you came over on D-Day plus one on a fast mine layer with Admiral Ramsey and ran aground, if I remember the, right. Uh, left end, and uh, when we went there, we got in a little bit too close, and at this terrific speed, something like the land miles, let's say 40 miles an hour, and we had a sandbank. And uh, we were just tired, oh, and everything shuddered and shook, and uh, it, it looked like we just wanted to shake a, a uh, ship to pieces. Nearly all of, us, all, all of us fell on our faces. But um, a destroyer came, took us off, took us back. But um, it was a very, very sad thing because the captain, it was partly my fault, because I insisted on his great speed, so he was and, and being as close as I could. So we got into uh, shallow water and it was a tough thing. Were any now, of the shore batteries still firing at that time? Oh, yes. yes. Still, uh, particularly on Omaha only. No. But of course, down tomorrow, we're going over here to this point to hope. And uh, that is a, uh, there's a very, very dramatic story there, and we'll probably start there tomorrow morning and talk about it. Good. Thanks. D-Day plus 20 years. General Eisenhower returns to Normandy. We'll continue in a moment. Point de Hoc is almost midway between the beaches of Omaha and Utah, the assigned targets of the American forces on D-Day. Here, protected by formidable 100-foot cliff, German heavy coastal guns had been emplaced. Now, the craters left by intensive Allied bombing still show the efforts made to knock them out before the invasion began. Standing on the almost impregnable cliff, General Eisenhower talked about the daring attack on Point de Hoc. 
Well, this uh, actually was a sort of an isolated, but a very dramatic uh, uh, phase of the operation. Uh, right on back on the back of where we are now, there had been spotted uh, five uh, large guns, and they were situated very well to uh, shoot into the assembly areas where our uh, unarmed transports would be um, uh, unloading and uh, you, the infantry and the small boats and so on getting them in. These guns, though, could shoot very 20,000 yards either way, and it was they were thought to be very, very dangerous, and that to uh, for naval bombardment, to take these fortified guns, you might say, and um, destroy them would be a, a pretty much of a uh, miracle if you could do that very quickly. So they worked out this ranger uh, program, and these rangers, you know, are especially uh, trained people. They're very hardy fellows, and they can do anything, mountains, swimming, swamps, everything. So they um, set three battalions, at, uh, I mean, uh, three companies, uh, the second uh, ranger battalion, to come up here, it's sort of an isolated part of the operation. They were supported by um, two destroyers out here with gunfire, and they started to climb this uh, promontory. Unfortunately, you see a point out there? Yeah. The attack of the infantry on, was on the other side of that point, but in the uh, dusk and the dark, the um, people bringing in the boats mistook that point for this one. And so they started to go there, but the uh, Colonel Rudder, who was in command, finally discovered the, uh, the mistake and got them over here. Well, this uh, brought them in about uh, uh, 30 minutes late. Now, the, the uh, plan was that when these three got up here, they would signal for their, the rest of them, the uh, rest of the rangers, about seven companies, I think, several hundred men, to come up and support them, help them. Well, they were so late getting that the other people decided that they hadn't gotten up here, so they went on with the main attack, of the infantry attack, uh, straight into inland. So these people, though, finally, with the, with the greatest difficulty, uh, climbed this cliff. I think somebody back at headquarters said when this operation was first described uh, to the operations people, uh, he, he looked with horror at them and said, why, three old ladies with brooms could sweep the rangers off well, that cliff. Well, of course, uh, the German had to look uh, a number of places. He didn't know exactly where these people were coming up. Now, what they did, they had different types of mortars that uh, shot big grapnel hooks up here, and they were... Uh, fastened with chains, and they got up uh, ladders and so on, and finally got up here and, uh, and took this point. They weren't seen, and uh, then they pulled up the ladder, and once one of them got up with a, an automatic rifle, he could drive the others away, you see, and just a few minutes, those fellows were up here, because they were regular monkeys in climbing. There weren't very many uh, Germans here, because these big guns, which had been spotted and photographed, were hauled back about 1,200 yards into a uh, wood or an orchard and concealed there. Well, the uh, rangers got that far and uh, destroyed these guns. This was getting now toward afternoon, and the Germans began to, to uh, counterattack. Uh, we came in here with about 225 rangers. About 30 or 40 of them were killed or wounded in uh, cl doing the climb up. And um, so they would say, uh, whole 180 to start with. Well, they, they got a, these uh, counterattacks, so no one could help them. The other people were tied down there, and of course there was no one attacking here on this side. And uh, they were uh, under counterattack for several hours. It really held out for two days. And when they, when they finally uh, uh, were rescued by the infantry coming along here on the 2nd Battalion of the 115th Infantry, 16th Infantry, uh, there was 90 of them left. But they were still, as far as they were concerned, good shape, and they did their job. It was a very uh, dramatic uh, piece of, uh, of uh, personal Well, suppose we go along and look at Omaha Beach. Well, I think we, I think we should, because there's where the, the big attack, and then that was the one that ran into real resistance. All, the way, all along the line, that was the worst of it. Omaha Beach, the main coast of Normandy directly fronting on the English Channel, the center of the Allied attack. Its high ground gave every advantage to the enemy. General Eisenhower stopped to inspect a German observation post overlooking the beach. General, from this bunker overlooking the beaches, uh, the German must have had a tremendous sight on D-Day morning. Yes, uh, one uh, German observation officer was supposed to have said, uh, my goodness, 
I've just uh, looked out and seen all the ships that there are in the world out there. Probably the fog lifted a little bit, you know, and it came just as all the, uh, of a sudden thing like on a screen. And it was just, a, it, was, it was unbelievable to, when you saw all of these things are put together. Several from the uh, German officers that you've talked to uh, since the war and the memoirs you've read, what, what is your version of what happened back there at command headquarters when these fellows up here in the bunkers began calling back the report? Well, of course, uh, the, one of them was unbelief. Unbelief because of the, um, of the weather. Uh, second, uh, uh, unbelief because uh, their uh, communications were so badly cut up. It was a complete state of confusion for the high command for the moment. Uh, Rundstedt didn't know what was happening. And of course, all of these division commanders along the line, they knew less. And, uh, and Mount Rommel wasn't here for the moment. General, do you think that if Marshal Rommel had not left the front uh, on June 5th to either visit his wife in Stuttgart on her birthday, which happened to be June 6th, or to see Hitler, which is sort of the official version of where he was going, do you think that his presence here would have made a great deal of difference? No, I don't. He, uh, he couldn't have known any more than these people did. Now, he, did, he was a great believer that the invasion had to be hit right at the uh, beach. And he might have put um, a more prompt counterattack somewhere, but he couldn't have done it in great strength because he didn't know where his own troops were, what they were doing, and uh, what we were doing. Perhaps because he was in great favor with uh, Hitler at that time, his own personal demand for those two panzer divisions, which were never committed on D-Day, uh, might have made a difference, do you think? Well, uh, possible, again. Yeah. But um, there was no use, there's no use putting a panzer division until you know where you're putting it. So uh, then along here, where, where we really were putting our strength, between uh, here and, uh, and Khan on our uh, left, well, he, they, no one knew exactly what was happening. And uh, so I don't think he could have done too much, because they began to use the Panzer Division the following day anyway. Then, as General Eisenhower drove along the now empty expanse of Omaha Beach, he explained why, in spite of the 200 yards of open beach swept by enemy fire, the landings had to be made at low tide. Well, the only trouble was uh, this whole beach had been, uh, Rommel had, uh, had just stoned it with obstacles, every kind of miserable, vicious obstacle, and most of them were pine, uh, mine. Therefore, if you'd have tried to come in here with these ships, we'd just all been blown up and, or had ourselves, uh, you know, uh, stabbed in the bottom and sunk. And so we had to have this uh, low tide in order to get at this business. And that's exactly what we, uh, figured it. But General, was it these underwater obstacles that made Omaha the toughest of the beaches, as it was? Well, of course, that was one part of it, but uh, this uh, beach was very heavily uh, fortified and uh, manned. For example, there were four batteries of uh, field artillery in here, and there were 85 machine gun nests, to say nothing of all of the concrete fortifications, uh, some of which still remain. There were eight uh, big bunkers, each of which had a 75 gun or more with uh, a local support for that gun. And there were uh, 35 uh, pillboxes, each of which had uh, guns that all ranged from machine guns uh, up to uh, 88 millimeters. They had, uh, uh, I think it was 18 anti-tank guns, and finally uh, there were rocket la launchers, uh, launcher sites. I forget how many of those, but say, uh, I think it was uh, about 20. All of that over how long a stretch of beach? The beach is about the total of the uh, beach we were attacking was about four miles. And, uh, but the uh, area we had to cover, that is the uh, sector for this fifth corps that was attacking through here, which was the 29th Infantry and the 1st Infantry, uh, stretched out finally to about 10 miles. Well, now, what was the chronology of D-Day morning here? The troops hit the beach here. About what time? Well, they hit the beach, as I recall, about 7.25. That's what they're supposed to. And uh, we were trying to get a simultaneous beaches. I think uh, down in the British sector, uh, General Montgomery found it necessary because of uh, uh, rocky beaches to uh, shift the times a little bit. But by and large, they were supposed to get in here about 7.30. But then I think the um, uh, uh, support ships started firing about 6.30. Uh, 
must uh, remember, Waller, that all of this sand was filled with obstacles, and there had been some attempts to cut the uh, lanes that we wanted through them, but it wasn't very successful. So out behind that, we were loading equipment and hoping to get it in. For example, the uh, swimming tanks that we wanted to have to lead the attack, there were, out of one group of 28 of them, 20 of them were just turned over and drowned at the bottom of the ocean. Now, some of the men, fortunately, got out, but, uh, but there's where they were. And uh, of all the artillery, and I forget how many batteries, I think it was three battalions at least, we wanted to get in that day, we got in one battery. These guns just uh, turned over in this rough uh, weather, and, uh, and there they were. So everything was <laughs> gone wrong. It could go on wrong. And as I say, finally, the thing that uh, pulled us out was the bravery and the courage and the initiative of the, of the American GI. That's what did it. During the course of the day, this beach got so plugged up that the beachmaster had to tell the new LCIs and LCTs coming in to circle. And they were sort of like milling cattle out there and still getting shot at. And it was just a really terrible uh, situation in, the, in, in this section. Now, some of them, you remember, had been in these crowded ships for four days. And we'd had a one day of postponement. So when they came out here, and now they were told, now don't get in your, your boats yet, uh, because we don't know what's going to happen. They were lying in those ships, and those that were in the small boat were even worse, because they were getting seasick. And you know, any of us, we get seasick, we just lie down and cry for someone to come and help us out. These people, when they got out of that, uh, those things, had to be right at their, uh, the top of their form. They had to be giving out everything they possibly could to win this uh, battle. So they came in those uh, little ships, and then, of course, finally they would ground. And now you were, uh, you had a long, broad space to come across here, and they had to come, uh, had to wade, some of them, and uh, because even LCTs and LCIs are not riding on top of the water, they're down in the, in the water, two couple feet. So they had to wade and then begin the sprinting, so they up here to get a place where they could begin uh, shooting. I tell you, it was uh, remarkable that they, uh, under the conditions, they did this well. Now, sometimes they'd lie behind the uh, vehicles that had been disabled, and they would uh, uh, get in little bunches, and then finally they got sick of that because the tide came in. You have a 22-foot tide, remember, and it comes up very quickly, so they were in danger of them drowning. So they got up here. They were under fire all the time, and finally uh, some hardy soul just got up and says, Come on, fellas, I'm sick of this, and let's try it. And uh, we began to see these little individual acts of heroism. Something to it, uh, very uh, acting, you know, and the fellow starts off with that uh, high ground up there, and you get two or three behind him, they get to become 20 and 30, and finally you've got some real power. And things begin to loosen up. Did you ever learn who was the man who finally said, let's get off these beaches and get in them? Well, there was no one here. You see, up until the, until the, uh, you can get communication with, uh, between uh, companies to battalions and battalions to regiments and regiments to your division, there's not much that a fellow can do. He doesn't know what's going on. It had to be the local commanders, the uh, platoon leaders and the squad leaders. That was not a general battle, after all. I, We'd all done all the planning. We thought we had made the best plan that would save the most lives and get the most uh, benefit out of it. But those are the people that had to do the job, and we must never forget that. It was just the GI and the uh, platoon and company and the uh, 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 squad leader. General, was there any thought during uh, the difficult hours, D-Day, here on the beach of uh, withdrawing? No, uh, the General Bradley told me later it would have been uh, impossible to have brought these people back and trying to re-embark them in, in the ships. Matter of fact, the ships were doing something else that time. But what he did uh, begin to uh, uh, study was the possibility of taking his follow-ups, who now couldn't come in here because of the fire and the jam on the beach, and taking some of them uh, into Utah, trying to cut around the, this whole area to, and therefore relieve it, and some of them possibly even into the British sector, on to the eastward. You must remember we had an objective. You see that high ground right above there? Mm -hmm. Now behind that is a, is a road, and that road uh, runs all the way through to Senia from the right through Bayou and uh, to the way on the left, on our left. And um, 
they, they were, that was their objective. And finally, oh, about uh, three or four in the afternoon, began to make, we began to make real penetration. And everything began to loosen up, and we gave a sigh of relief, particularly the commanders on the spot. And by the evening, you know, I don't want to make any mistake, the commanders were ashore. Bradley was ashore. Uh, Giroux was ashore, who was one of the corps commanders, and uh, Collins. He was ashore, and the division commanders, uh, Gerhardt and uh, Tubner over here, and uh, Barton over on Utah. They were all ashore and doing their business. But it was uh, late in the evening, and they'd hoped to have been on the shore in a couple of hours, because we thought we were going to have that road up there in two hours. And we were right, right here. That's where we were. What were the losses here on Omaha Beach on D-Day? Well, of course, uh, the first day you couldn't tell by counting uh, the drowned, uh, the killed, the wounded, and some missing. We had over 2,000 casualties on, uh, on this beach, uh, the, the Omaha Beach. And these youngsters <coughs> coming in here paid this terrible price. And uh, on this one beach alone, on that one day, it was uh, quite heavy. Hard to imagine looking at this peaceful scene today that 20 years ago this beach was what you've just described. It, it's true. When you go back and see these people out uh, sailing in their pleasure boats, and you see them all along here, and the people, they've been swimming, or all sorts of uh, taking advantage of the nice weather and the lovely beach. Came over here. It was just unbelievable. The material. The, you know, I always used to think of it in the man hours, the people, the, the wealth of the nations that they poured forth. It is almost unreal to look at it today. The, everything, the horizon is peaceful, and uh, outside there it's a vacant, and there's no smoke and fire and all the rest of it. But it's, it's a wonderful thing to believe, uh, uh, to remember that this is what those fellows were fighting for and sacrificing for, that these people could do this. CBS reports, D-Day plus 20 years will continue in just a moment. San Mar Aglis is a little Norman crossroads town brevetted by fame in the annals of D-Day. Even before the main attack began on the beaches, the U.S. 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions dropped into this area to form a shield against counterattacks. The fighting was fierce. Sniper action and counterattacks came from every side. Many prisoners were rounded up, searched and questioned before the 4th U.S. Infantry Division arrived to relieve the paratroopers. Here in the shadow of the old church, General Eisenhower paused in his revisit to Normandy to exchange wartime experiences with Madame Simone Renault, wife of the wartime mayor of saint mer Aglis. What time of night did you see your first American soldier? At about uh, nine, um, the 12, uh, excuse me, I, I remember exactly. I mean, uh, 10 o'clock in the evening of the 5th of June. Uh, the 5th of June? Yes. Came Ten. in early, one of the uh, scouts coming in front first. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the marker perhaps yes. came earlier mm -hmm. uh, because there was a heavy bombing on the coast. Mm -hmm and the uh, fires uh, in barns and houses were raging mm -hmm. before the paratroopers fell. Now, how, when, um, when this attack started, how many of the uh, citizens of the town, were they all here in their homes? Or all the people were, were here. here. They, had, but, they hadn't left their homes because of many, the bombing? No, oh. they have not left because of the bombing. But many of them had been thrown out of their houses by the Germans, oh, yes, sure. who would occupy the houses. Yeah. Uh, but they had been uh, taking shelter, shelter uh, just in the surrounding of St. Mary yes. They had not left. Yes. Everybody was here. I see. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I can tell you this aerial invasion was a big, a wonderful surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, we dare not believe, we dare not hope such liberation and it was a wonderful thing that happened to us. Well, how many civilians were killed during that uh, two days? Uh, 60. 60? Yes. Mm -hmm. As I told you, the paratroopers fell everywhere around us. Well. Everywhere, on the square, on the big, big trees. There were some big, huge trees at that time. Mm -hmm. And on the roofs, on the meadows, and on the steeple. Uh, John Steele uh, hanged from the top of the steeple for hours.
entangled by his cable mm -hmm. and being swung by the wind and th being full in the firing zone from all sides yeah. and also from the top of the steeples because there were some snipers, German snipers, mm -hmm. hidden in the steeples. So I suppose he had a very bad time, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he is still alive and he's a very jolly fellow. He's called John Steele of Wilmington, North Carolina. Oh, indeed. Yes. Goodness. Mm -hmm. And they are quite an adventure, had not they? Well, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many of us would like that. Oh. Mm -hmm. And there were four parachutes on the steeple. Mm -hmm. On the on the steeple. Oh, that's... That means there were three of us paratroopers who fell. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were not uh, hanging yes, on the yes. top mm -hmm. like him. And he played dead. Oh, yes. Uh, not to what? be hit mm -hmm. by. <laughs> probably saved him. <laughs> probably, probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, now you know, of course, why we sent the paratroopers in here, I suppose. Oh, we did not know. <laughs> well, oh. you see, we were start starting this uh, invasion. Yes. We wanted to capture this peninsula and Sherberg very soon. And, uh, you know, down here at Utah Beach, yes. uh, behind us, there was the marshes on this side of the beach. Yes. Now, we wanted to get the openings from those marshes so that our soldiers on the beach could come up. So we dropped the paratroopers here in this region, first to capture this town, so they block all the roads and uh, let the Germans through it, and then block all of those openings, I mean, uh, take care of those openings down there and keep them open for our, the 4th Division, which yes. came over the beaches. So we landed the 101st here, and then just to the um, uh, some, just to the west, uh, we landed the uh, 82nd Division. Yes. Now, of course, they got scattered around. Yes. And that was quite lucky in us, for us at the time. We thought it was a disaster. But, Certainly. But because they were scattered so badly, the Germans didn't know anything we were doing. No. They were just bewildered. And their reaction the next day was, was very weak because they didn't know where, where we were going or what we were doing. They just no. thought we were crazy. They were lost. <laughs> they were lost, they were terrified, they did not know what happened, uh, and uh, really, I think it was a, the first disaster for <laughs> them to see the airborne troops. <laughs> and I, I am glad that you tell me, General, mm -hmm. why you chose mm -hmm. this uh, little town of yeah. Sainte Mère Église. Yeah. Because it's a great honor to have been the first American bridgehead in France. <laughs> <laughs> On the left of the Allied line, the British, Canadian, and Free French divisions landed. Gold, Juno, and Sword beaches were their code names. The Norman resort town of Aeromanche was a key sector. A vital artificial harbor, called Mulberry, was established here to funnel the supplies of war to the invading armies. Now, almost 20 years later, through a spindrift of rain and haze, Parts of the old mulberry could still be seen sticking out of the water as General Eisenhower talked of invasion logistics. Well, you know, there's something that uh, armies and navies have known for centuries. When you have a major invasion on a hostile shore, you have to capture a major port very soon. Well, now, uh, one thing that we were quite sure that uh, while we might capture either Sherberg or something of that kind was what one were shooting for, uh, it would probably be destroyed pretty badly, and in the meantime, we were going to need a lot of heavy equipment. And moreover, the English Channel is a notorious for its uh, foul weather and uncertain weather. And uh, so it just seemed to be uh, in the cards that we had to do something uh, very soon and very radical. And as far back as 1942, Admiral Mountbatten happened to say to me that, well, you won't have a port, but you will have to make one. Well, this sounded to me rather fantastic, but uh, actually, uh, somewhere in the early 43, the uh, British particularly began to think of this problem very seriously. And uh, the Prime Minister interested himself uh, in it. And uh, so they conceived this idea of building artificial harbors, too. One for the American uh, side uh, on the west and the other one for the British here in front of uh, Aramanche. Now, this one, of course, turned out to be very successful, and you see the uh, remains of it all the way around, and that was uh, roughly uh, seven miles from this end all around through that uh, whole file of uh, breakwaters that they built out there. 
the Prime Minister himself told me that with almost 50,000 men that were working on this one problem alone, over there, workmen and uh, managers and everybody else, and uh, I think thousands of tons of seal, and I can't tell you how many, probably uh, seven, 800,000 tons of cement in these harbors. So uh, it was just a major project in itself. The breakwaters were uh, made up of several parts. One was sinking um, ships first to get started. General, that was deliberate sinking of ships that had been assigned to the task of coming over here and forming no, the first no, breakwater. No, no, the ships had been allotted for this. Uh, there were some old battleships even, and uh, big uh, freighters that largely outlived their usefulness. They, we didn't take the new ones, but we did put some big ones in there. And uh, it made it a very impressive sight, as long as uh, you could see it there. And then this big breakwater was made of the concrete blocks that we call phoenixes. They were built so you could float them over here, then sink them onto the, this rock formation of, of the beach. And finally, then they built piers that went up with it, uh, and down with the tide, which is very uh, high here, you know, 21 feet, something like that. And they had to have flexible bridges. So the whole thing was a very uh, masterly conception, and the actual completion of the thing was almost miraculous. General, was there ever a, a time in the first days of the landing when supply became uh, so critical as to endanger the operation? Well, in that uh, storm of June the 19th, we were pretty well down, you see, because we were, we had to ration our troops from the beginning so you could get reserves to uh, make the big uh, attack. But that great storm, which threw some three to 500 ships up on these beaches that had come over here by on their own power, I mean, that kind of thing, it was a terrific thing. And of course, it was uh, uncomfortable. But the storm was so great that the uh, Germans couldn't really move themselves, you see. So it wasn't nearly as uh, dangerous as it could have been. Now, unfortunately, our uh, artificial uh, port over on the American side was on a sand-based, really, and the shelving was different. And when the uh, storm came, it broke up. This one didn't. They used this one right on, oh, uh, until September. And probably, I think we got to Antwerp. This was used very heavily, and it was a godsend to us. And the, and the British were the ones that conceived it and had the great uh, major uh, part of its uh, building. General, the the fact that that storm came in on June 19th, which was the next available date for you to have gone uh, with the tides and the moonlight and so forth, uh, sort of proves uh, the wisdom of going on the 6th, doesn't it? Well, at least it proves we were lucky, uh, Walter, because uh, no one could have predicted that storm at that time. But uh, if we had tried to go on at that time, and uh, let's say hit uh, on the 18th, we would have absolutely been wrecked. Nothing could have stayed. It. it was the most terrible storm. That, uh, the, they said the, the worst storm in the channel in 40 years. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, I had the 83rd Division lying in uh, boats, uh, or, I mean ships, all anchored right uh, off the beach. They couldn't even attempt to unload. They, for three days, they were tossed around, and you have never seen, when this division came over, and I was there, when they unland, uh, uh, lo unloaded, they were, every one of them was just seasick as they could be. And uh, they were just for a, they had to rest for a, a full day before they could do anything. And uh, I couldn't come over. I couldn't get them over in the, in the ship. I couldn't get over in a plane. And for three days, I was just, just bound down, that's all. General, in those days, beginning uh, June 7th, when you made your first reconnaissance no, in, no. The, in the boat, uh, how often did you come over? Uh, well, it would vary. Sometimes you'd have to go back to the Maine to get a lot of things straightened out up in uh, London and then down below, down in uh, Portsmouth. Now, I remember I came right back on the uh, 12th because General Marshall came over. And I remember uh, uh, I took uh, him and uh, Admiral King and General Arnold ashore. And then with Bradley, we went all around. And uh, uh, things, of course, were pretty well tidied up. We were going uh, pretty well towards Sher Sherberg now. Uh, then from there on, I kept going back uh, by plane or by ship uh, whenever I get time to do it. And um, then about uh, early July, I told them I thought we were getting room. I could put my little 
part of my little tent camp over here on this side. And uh, but, but before the end of July, I, I, I was living over here most of the time. Did you ever have any narrow squeaks with the enemy uh, during those visits? Well, uh, not particularly. Uh, once in a while, there would be something happened, and everybody would get uh, very nervous. But uh, no, I never had. The uh, one day I went up in the road, and it was a counterattack came across it and cut it off. But we found a way back, and there was no the difficulty that way. That was 79th Division, and uh, uh, going back uh, most of the time, you'd have or you'd have uh, once in a while a little narrow squeak on a landing, on a bad landing somewhere, something like that. One day, I uh, I don't remember what time. Went into a beach that was mined. And we had this a force landing. And this little uh, la uh, light plane was my uh, pilot. And we, we got but we got out. And it wasn't very comfortable, though. You, you landed on a mine beach? Yeah. yeah. And well, the, the map showed it was mine. Of course, uh, we very carefully picked our way up uh, out of there, I'll tell you that. Well, was that the time that you twisted your knee? Yeah. Yes. Twist my knee, and there's a bunch of must have been 10 men in a Jeep like this, and they picked me up, and they still got in. And how they did it, I don't know. But we had a big time. General, this beach at Aramanche yeah. was, of course, in the uh, center of the British uh, landing area. Right. The British came ashore without very much opposition, didn't they? Well, just in spots. It was not a general opposition uh, along this uh, particular beach, and they uh, got uh, some, uh, put it this way. It wasn't anything like the uh, Omaha Beach. It was a great deal more like the uh, Utah Beach in uh, resistance. But in here, there wasn't a great deal of defense, although the British were very careful not to go in against the town of Aramont, because they wanted to use those beaches for this uh, artificial uh, port. They didn't want a lot of wreckage on there. They took it from the land side, you know. But nevertheless, uh, by and large, the British Army with the Canadians was on shore, did very well on uh, D-Day. And although they didn't have all their D-Day objectives, they were well established. And of course, this gave uh, great confidence that Omaha would soon be solved. Now, the strange thing they did, they had a uh, British division coming on, on uh, the left and one on the right. And in the center was the Canadian one. I have never asked them reason why they did that, but it looked uh, odd in uh, the formation. But all of them fought well, and it was, they were a very fine outfit. Bobo Dempsey was commanding the uh, British Army and Creer the uh, Canadian. So when the buildup came on, they became the uh, two army commanders in uh, Montgomery's army group. Now, they were supposed to push inland and get to Caen on D plus one, I believe. Well, on D-Day. They were supposed to get it. You see, right just uh, south of Caen, and over uh, toward Falaise was some very fine open ground, and we wanted to uh, develop our airfields as rapid as we could. Well, they ran into uh, stubborn uh, resistance here in front of Caen. Of course, the Germans saw it. One thing he had to do was to keep that road junction, because through that big road is where everything went up toward uh, the west. Well, they, uh, they promptly uh, reinforced that rapidly, and for one solid month, the uh, British were stymied there. They couldn't move. Now, we wanted to, that ground, and we'd had it on our objectives, but it just was one of those things that happened in war, that's all. How about Kerr and, and Dempsey? Uh, they, they had the tough job, then, of facing these troops on almost a static line here that's through right. that month. That's right. They're, um, they did a very fine job. They kept the morale of their troops up, and they were, they were really two fine soldiers. Yeah. Did uh, General Montgomery <laughs> go along with this? plan of oh, yeah. uh, holding him oh, on yeah. account? Yeah. Were you at the time critical of uh, General Montgomery? I wasn't, or his uh, I, I wasn't. Some of you newspaper fellows were. But the fact is <clears throat> that when we saw what is happening from there on, we uh, Montgomery, we had Montgomery uh, keeping the, up with the pressure to keep all of the strength there so that uh, when we realized that finally that the Americans were going to have to make the real breakout of the beachhead, that gave them, uh, gave us less uh, resistance over there than, than over here, because he just endangering Canada, uh, or Khan, so much they had to come in there. Well, we've had a typical example here today of the kind of changeable weather you faced uh, in Normandy 20 years ago. Now it's clear and the sun's coming yes. out. As a matter of fact, uh, it does all time. <clears throat> no one can uh, predict weather in uh, Northwest Europe, I'll tell you that. At least uh, I've never known anyone that could. D-Day plus 20 years will continue in just a moment.
This is the Norman countryside behind the beaches. These hedgerows were an unexpected hazard. And General Eisenhower told a story of GI ingenuity. This attack in this uh, hedgerow country was terrific because here, let's say this field would be 50 yards square. You'd try to take man uh, and uh, sneak along the hedges to get behind the defenders of the next edge. Well, on either side, they'd be flanked by the riflemen. So you just had your tanks to get in there with these light guns, couldn't knock them out, and they could give you the firepower and the infantry could uh, get on, and that's the way we finally broke through. So, you know, one of the biggest problems uh, the correspondents had in Normandy during the battle was explaining how a hedgerow could stop a 30 or 35 ton tank, because people at home thought of a hedge as the kind of hedge they have, but not like this. Just stop really. here a minute, uh, Walter, and I'll just show you how this thing worked. Now, here's the hedgerow, and it's not really a hedge, it's a bank of earth. And frequently, this is four feet thick, five feet thick, and often four feet uh, tall. And the hedge grows right out of that thing. So that uh, your tank, it can go through the hedge all right. But when it does, it bellies up, you see, and his guns are pointing straight into the sky. And uh, so the fellow's anti-tank guns can just uh, go right through that soft underside of the tank and just uh, put you out of action. Now, the problem had uh, bothered us for some weeks. And finally, a little sergeant in an ordnance department, his name was Kulin, and he had an idea. All it was in the world was to took a tank and uh, with welding a bar on there, they welded then uh, a little uh, plows, you might call them snouts. Actually, we found the steel for it down on the beaches where the Germans had uh, made these beach um, uh, obstacles down there. We took that steel, welded a little uh, plows, you might call them. They just cut off this bank as you went into it. And this kept your tank right square level guns blazing when the next hedgerow, which is only 50 yards away. And on top of that, you really carried some of your own camouflage with you as you went through the thing. This idea very quickly got into the very top echelons, to General Bradley, to be specific. He looked, uh, took a look at this man's uh, homemade model, and he just went ecstatic, proving that the Army brass is not always just Colonel Blimps. Now, this, uh, this was before we made our breakout on July 25th and captured uh, St. Lo. And I can't, but I think for the assault battalions, at least, we had um, two out of every three tanks had these things on. And this thing was really a godsend to us. And um, uh, by the way, Sergeant Kulin uh, later lost a leg in the war and was invalided uh, um, home. Why didn't uh, our intelligence tell us about this hedgerow problem uh, so we could prepare in advance for it? Well, because uh, no one had re ever before really had tried to attack through these hedgerows, and uh, no one had thought of it. And remember this, we didn't expect to make a blitz down through these things anyway. Uh, on the left of the whole line, we expected that the British Army would be down in the high ground below, or in the open ground behind Falaise. This would make it easier for us to get down to San Lo, and it was only then we were going to start our wheel to the same, to the left, you see. Well, actually, what happened, uh, because of the tremendous defense the Germans put in around uh, Caen, we finally had to start from way back at, uh, at San Lo and swing from there. But then that swinging around uh, movement with just a whole uh, effort to capture the uh, German 7th Army uh, sprung up from the fact that they uh, didn't want to give up that line, so they began to attack right into our hinge. And that gave us a big opportunity, and, and Bradley, I think, uh, probably thought of the idea first and said, let's swing in closer and capture these fellows right here, and we won't have to fight them on the scene. And I said, you go right ahead, that's fine. And as we closed these uh, armies, one on the other, the British on the north and the American coming around from the right, the Germans tried to get out. And, of course, we brought to bear all of our air, all of our machine gun fire and artillery. And, you know, uh, the soldiers began to speak of that as a great killing ground. They, uh, I think the battle ended, as I recall, about August 16th or 17th. And I went in there about two or three days later. And uh, doing all the acres and acres 
it was just nothing but dead. And uh, it was the scene was even uh, more terrible because of the fact that Germany were using a great deal of horse-drawn artillery. And whole teams had just have been killed by the same shell burst from just laying flat there with their guns. And honestly, you could have walked a, a quarter of a mile without ever stepping on ground. It was a horrible scene. And it was the end of the uh, Normandy campaign. From then on, it was exploitation right up to the Rhine, almost, or up to the borders of Germany. The American cemetery at Saint Laurent on the sea, overlooking Omaha Beach in Normandy. Richard Volbrock of Illinois, comrade in arms known only to God, an unknown soldier. Ephraim Lowe of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, I guess. Chester Tenhagen what of Virginia. What man? 86 Battalion, Claude Cole, 90th Division of Arizona. Joseph Slovak, Pennsylvania, 29th Division. One of the assault divisions. Russell Woodward of the 29th, and Harry Ramsey of the 8th from New Jersey. Willard Klaus, 82nd Airborne from Kentucky. Oh, yes. I think there's some 9,000 boys who fly here. I guess uh, most of the casualties from D-Day are here at Saint Laurent, overlooking Omaha Beach. All except those that were taken uh, home. About 60% of them were taken home. Oh. Um, the identifiable. Uh, yeah. And of the unidentified, uh, there are some here, and then there are the names of the missing, of course, missing, in the monument. Yes. And then, of course, all the unidentified are here. 1,500 uh, missing who never were found from this That's called area. the Garden of the Missing over there, and, and the names are all in the, on the walls, on the other corner of the cemetery. This cemetery, Saint Laurent, includes uh, all the D-Day casualties, most of those back in through the Normandy fighting, I suppose. Up until we broke out. Uh, that, that's when the, the, you see, the quartermaster put these temporary cemeteries in. They were gathered in here by the American Battle Monuments Commission uh, up uh, as far as um, uh, down to San Lo and that area. The breakout. And of course, this is just one of the cemeteries that stretch from well, from here around the world, really. Walter, this D-Day has a very special meaning for me. And I'm not referring merely to the anxieties of the day, the anxieties that were a, a natural part of uh, sending in an invasion where you knew that many hundreds of boys were going to give their lives or be maimed forever. But uh, my mind goes back so often to this fact. On D-Day, my own son graduated from West Point. And uh, after his training uh, with his division, he came over with the 71st Division. But that was some time after this event. But on the very day he was graduating, these men came here, British and our other allies, Americans, to storm these beaches for one purpose only, not to gain anything for ourselves, not to fulfill any ambitions that America had for conquest, but just to, pre to preserve freedom, systems of self-government in the world. Many thousands of men have uh, died for ideals such as these. And here again, in the 20th century, for the second time, Americans, along with the rest of the free world, but Americans had to come across the ocean to defend those same values. Now, my own son has been very fortunate. He has had a, a very full life since then. He is a father of four lovely children that are very precious to my wife and me. But these young boys, so many of them, over whose graves we have been treading, looking at, wondering and contemplating about their sacrifices, they were cut off in their prime. They, are, they have families that grieve for them, but they never knew 
the great experiences of going through life like uh, my son, I can enjoy. I devoutly hope that we will never again have to uh, see such scenes as these. I think and hope, pray, that the humanity has learned more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance, and they bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. So every time I come back to um, these beaches, or when he, any day when I think about that day 20 years ago now, I say once more, we must find some way to work to, to peace and to a, really to gain an eternal peace for this world.